Hey now, welcome to another edition of the Inside BS Show. Today, we have a show that I have been looking forward to for a very long time. I have my friend, Sammy Azari. He's with us today. And Sammy is a federal criminal defense attorney, which means he defends people who commit serious crimes, mostly white collar folks who commit really big crimes that the federal government has accused them of. They don't necessarily, they haven't necessarily committed them. Everyone's innocent until proven guilty. Sammy helps them. That's his job. That's his mission. We're going to find out how he got into it. We're going to find out what he does to get business. I think everyone has a lot to learn from my time with Sammy today because Sammy is a prolific networker. He's a giver and he's a business development superstar. So if you like watching all the criminal stuff that's on TV, that's what Sammy does every day. If you like getting business in your professional firm, that's really what Sammy does every day. This is the interview for you. So please join me in welcoming my friend Sammy Azari to the Inside BS Show. Sammy, thanks for joining us. I'm really excited to have you here. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me, and I'm looking forward to uh, our discussion. All right, so uh, for more than 15 years now, you've been uh, helping people who are accused of crimes, right? Talk about how this became the work that you've chosen to do uh, with, with your life. So why did you choose criminal defense? And then how did you get into like really serious stuff? I mean, we can talk about some of the stuff that your, that your clients are accused of, but this is like their freedom is on the line every time they come in your office. So how did you choose this, Sammy? Yeah, well, I kind of fell into it and I'm really glad I did. Uh, so I, you know, I have a bachelor's degree in electrical and computer engineering from Purdue, and the plan was to go to law school and possibly become a, a patent attorney, a patent litigator specifically, because I, I knew I wanted to be in the courtroom. And so after gradu uh, before uh, passing the bar and after graduating from law school, I actually got a job waiting tables while I waited for the bar results to come out. And then once the, once the results came out, I found out I passed, I got a job. I decided to keep my job waiting tables nights and weekends. And, um, you know, so sure enough, my, my friends just kept getting arrested and I just found myself having to continue to represent them in criminal court. So once I got a taste for being in criminal court, I just really liked it and never looked back. So uh, did I read this right? You, you've had over, uh, did I, 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 this is, isn't a mistake. You've had over a hundred trials. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Uh, between jury and bench trials throughout my career, I've tried a lot of cases. And you're you're a young guy. You're not an old guy. So you've been to court <laughs> a lot. How did you get all of that experience? Because I know a lot of people who would kill for that level of experience in a courtroom. Yeah. So I, I took a lot of cases to trial. I felt that there were a lot of cases that I, I could win or if I lost that the result wasn't going to be any worse for my client. And so there was, there was no... Uh, issue with taking the matter to trial and just at least putting the boxing gloves on, seeing what you can do. Uh, so I got a lot of experience that way. And then when I wanted to handle more significant crimes, I actually just reached out to more seasoned attorneys and said, you know, I'm looking for more trial work. You know, I'd love to piggyback on a trial that you have, watch you in action and learn something and take on a few witnesses. And so slowly I, I got opportunities to do that from people that were willing to mentor me along the way. Um, I remember there was a span of eight weeks where I did five jury trials and that was, it was a lot of work, but it was also a lot of fun, very rewarding. Well, and that, so what you just said there talks, it speaks volumes about your ability to develop relationships that are based on trust, because even if you're second chair in a case that's in, that's at trial, somebody has to trust you in order to have you sitting next to them. So that really says a lot to me about you as a as a relationship builder, that you could reach out to people and they would trust you enough to say, all right, Sammy, come on, I'll, I'll share what, what's going on with you. And, you know, if you can help, you can help. I mean, people, you know, you might think to yourself, hey, listen, you know, Sammy's offering maybe in a lot of cases free legal help. But somebody who doesn't trust the other person, that person's going to be a, you know, it's going to be a burden on them. The fact that Sammy, that you were trusted that much, I mean, that speaks volumes to me. Talk a little bit about 
the, the explain to people the early going how you felt talk about your first couple of cases what how did it feel for somebody to walk in and tell you hey listen this is what happened i don't know what i'm gonna do what is that feeling like yeah you know they're putting a lot of trust in you and they're coming to you at usually with the types of clients i represented it was probably the worst moment in their life and some of these crimes weren't even all that significant that the penalties weren't really that severe their life wasn't going to get impacted in any way but um, and I say that as a criminal defense attorney, but they had no experience with that. So to them, it was the worst thing they'd ever done. They thought they were going to lose their job and they were going to be ostracized by the community. And so there was a lot of uh, uh, venting and and kind of them putting their faith in you that there's a lot on the line here and they're asking you to help. And so it was a tremendous responsibility, but one that I was really excited to take on. And I knew I could do uh, the, my clients a lot of good. And, and thankfully, I've been able to over the last 15 years. So your um, your experience in having people sit across the table from you, sit across the desk from you, sit next to you, explain to the folks who are listening, the folks who are watching, who winds up in your office. Because as a, as a guy who knows a lot of lawyers, I get calls from, I get calls one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning from people. Hey, my son did something stupid. Hey, I got caught doing this. Can you find somebody to help me? And these are, in my experience, most of them are just regular people. Explain who winds up in Sammy Azari's office talking about this being the worst moment of their life. Yeah. So typically, I mean, right now with the type of work that I do, it's typically somebody that is a you know board member or an executive in a company. It could be a CFO, um, it could be a commodities trader, anyone that's in the securities field. Uh, it could be anyone with a small business. So I, I recently represented a, a small business owner from central Illinois on tax fraud charges in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. So the types of people that I'll see have, you know, they're typically very successful. They're very intelligent. They come from good neighborhoods. They have good families. They're their parents. They're they have good children, and uh, you know they're they're just very nervous about the situation that's ahead. And my job is not only to help them legally, but also to kind of hold their hand and guide them through the process and just make them feel comfortable. And oftentimes, what I'll find is if someone's talking to multiple attorneys, and I'm one of them, one of the reasons that they hire me is maybe that I just had a better bedside manner than some of the other people. Um, you know, some other attorneys might be quick to quote a fee. They might be quick to get the client out of their office because they got too many things going on. And I try to make them feel like at that moment, I have nothing going on but them. Yeah, I love that perspective. And you mentioned a couple of things there that I want to I want to kind of get into a little bit. I'm always surprised when I sit with a, with a, a criminal defense attorney and they tell me, well, listen, you know, I quoted somebody the fee and they and they said they have to think about it. And I'm thinking to myself, so they're going to think about whether they go to jail or not. Like, I, I don't understand. <laughs> you know, are you shopping for like you don't there's three things, in my opinion, you don't shop for a bargain in. Right. One is parachutes. Two is dental work. <laughs> right. And the third is your criminal defense attorney. <laughs> right. I'm not looking for a bargain. I want the guy who's going to get the job done, because if he doesn't, I don't care how much money I have. It doesn't matter anymore. So talk to me about the moment when you quote the fee to somebody. And I, you know, I, I mean, we don't, we don't need to get into what your fee structure is because they weren't budgeting for hiring a criminal defense attorney, but you know, these are significant matters. You don't bill by the hour. In most cases, it doesn't make sense for you to bill by the hour. So you're charging them money to basically keep them out of jail or keep them from losing their job or, you know, keep them from something that's really going to impact the rest of their life from happening. What are some of the reactions you get and how do you respond to them? Yeah, you know, I mean, similar to what you said, I kind of go down that same that same speech when I'm telling them, you know, I mean, in some cases they're facing pretty significant prison terms. And I remember in, in one occasion, I had someone facing some very serious federal criminal charges and he had signed the retainer. He went home. His wife was upset that he signed the retainer and said that he had no business making that type of financial commitment without talking to her first, which makes perfect sense. But she actually rescinded the agreement because she didn't want to pay that much money. She felt she could get representation for cheaper elsewhere. And I just thought, 
I mean, this this client was facing a mandatory minimum. I mean, this was a very, very serious charge. Um, and the fact that it was more so about looking at the financial future as opposed to someone's freedom always astonishes me. I mean, I'm truly shocked when people say, well, I don't want to go broke. I said, well, I understand that, but <laughs> we're looking at bigger problems than you going broke at the moment. Yeah, if this doesn't work out, money is not going to be an issue for you because you're going to be a, a guest of the federal government for a very long time. So, um, Sammy, you know, the, the folks who are who, who wind up in your office, how many of them this is the you know, this is the only mistake they've ever made. It may be a significant mistake, but this is the only mistake they ever made. If you had to put a percentage on a ballpark, at how many people this is the only time they're ever they, they've ever been in your office ever going to be in your office? I would say 80 to 85%. Wow, it's that high. I was going to say half. Jeez, 80 to 85%. Okay. So it's somebody who, you know, they needed a little extra money. They thought they could get away with, you know, a couple of bucks here and there from their employer. It was a rounding error. Or it's somebody who was too close to somebody else who was committing some crime. So they got caught up in it. Explain to folks the difference between facing charges in federal court versus facing charges in, in state court and the resources that the federal government can bring to bear on someone? Yeah, well, well, typically, you know, when somebody is being investigated by the federal government, whether it be the FBI, ATF, DEA, or any other agency, I mean, there's years of investigative work that go into that. There's many agents that are assigned to a particular case. There's a federal prosecutor that's spearheading the investigation. Uh, they have grand jury uh, investigative tools to uh, subpoena materials, subpoena witnesses, have people testify before the grand jury. Uh, you don't really have that type of investigative work done in a, in a typical state case. Uh, state cases are, you know, let's say your, your your retail thefts, your DUIs, your domestic batteries. They're they're cases that have their arrests that happen fairly quickly. Uh, more knee jerk reactions happen in state court than in federal court. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of time and, re and money put into a federal investigation. So typically when someone's charged in federal court, it means someone spent the last few years making sure they had everything they could possibly have to prosecute you. And by the time a defense attorney gets involved, a federal prosecutor is really ready to try the case. And so you're just getting up to speed on something that they've spent the last two years putting together, having all their agents and all the documents ready to go. Um, so you're really fighting an uphill battle in federal court versus in state court when you're not. All right. So the person then comes into your office and typically they, they got a target letter or somebody came to visit them, meaning a, you know, a representative of one of those agencies came to visit them, or they heard that a representative of one of those agencies, you know, served a subpoena on a place where they work or something along those lines that the first sign of that, that's when they need to reach out to you. Because like you said, they're the, the case is already pretty far down the road, right? As soon as you know, something's going on. When, when, when is the best time for them to call you? The minute they know something, there was, there's no question about that. You hit the nail on the head there. The minute someone approaches you, even if they hand you their business card, they're from the FBI, all they want to do is talk to you. You need to contact an attorney. The minute you're served with a grand jury subpoena, you definitely need to call an attorney. And the more obvious ones are if, if your home or office is raided by the FBI documents were seized or you're just yanked out in handcuffs, then you definitely need an attorney. Um, I think in some cases, people uh, assume that when they're visited by the FBI or they are asked to come to the testify before the grand jury, that they might have a lawyer that doesn't really know what's going on. And I'm actually dealing with that situation right now in which the prior attorney actually recommended that this individual go testify before the grand jury. And uh, yeah, that's it's not something that I would have advised, certainly. And I don't think any other white collar lawyer would have advised it. Um, so it's, it's definitely important right away to um, arm yourself with the, the best uh, federal criminal attorney, someone that's familiar with these types of cases and swims in these waters. All right. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of scenarios that I've seen play out having lived. And I never, by the way, I never saw anything like this living in New York. Only when I moved to South Florida and lived in a condo building with a bunch of other people did I see stuff like this happen. But so the FBI shows up and they're not necessarily investigating me, but they want to ask me questions about somebody I know, somebody I work with, somebody I'm related to. 
Do I talk to him or do I not talk to him? Yeah, I always say no, not without an attorney. I mean, because the reality is, is you, you just don't know what they're looking at you as. It could be a witness, a subject or a target. And regardless if they tell you if you're just a witness that can help them out, it just it, it certainly never hurts to have an attorney. Obviously, the only downside is the financial cost associated with hiring one. But um, yeah, it, it would be it, it's just kind of silly if someone has the financial wherewithal to retain an attorney to just assume that they know best and proceed with, you know, giving the you know the agents the information that they're asking for. Well, and explain to people about the investigative technique of uh, what's the best way to say it? Oh, lying, right? <laughs> explain to people <laughs> the investigative techniques that agents of the government have at their disposal that we as regular citizens don't have? Well, they, they have a lot of information. So when they're asking questions, they're going to ask questions they know the answer to and questions that they genuinely don't know the answer to. And the minute they catch you in a line, now that's lying to a federal agent. That itself is a crime. So uh, there's really no sense in trying to outsmart or outwit or figure out how you can deceive a federal agency. You're not required to talk to them. Unless, of course, you're served with some sort of subpoena. Um, and even then, you're not required to. But uh, if someone comes knocking on your door, the smartest thing is if, if you're inclined to lie, just to not say anything at all. Yeah, and they can they can shade the truth as much as they want. They don't have a requirement to be truthful with you. But the minute that you're not truthful with them, you vi if it's a federal officer, you violated federal law and they got you. So... You know, that's that's the reason why you you engage a lawyer. Now, let's talk about candor in the other direction. Let's talk about the importance of candor with your attorney. Right. Sammy, I'm sure you've never had an experience where the client came into your office and they told you only a portion of the truth. How important is it that you know everything right from the beginning? Yeah. <laughs> it's extremely important. Um, and yes, that's happened on, on a few occasions, to say the least. Um, and in some instances, they're just concealing something from you that you would need to know. And in some instances, they're just blatantly lying to you. And so I tell my clients, look, I'm going to reserve judgment on the case until I receive all the discovery and have an opportunity to go through it. And in some cases, they want you know, they call me after about a month when I've reviewed maybe 20 or 30 percent of what I've gotten and they want to ask my opinion. So I still have 70 to, or, you know, eight, 70 to 80 percent of material still left to review. And I want to see exactly what evidence they have before I form an opinion. And also, I might have some material in there that I can see that I can confront my client with if I find out that they're being dishonest with me. And that's happened many times where I've had to say, well, you told me X and the discovery shows Y. So why did you tell me X? And they'll come clean or they'll say, well, the, you know, the statement's wrong that you know, is in the report. Um, but there's there's no sense in lying to your attorney. I mean, everything is confidential. No, no one's going to hear about it um, outside of the office. And it's only going to hinder my ability to do my job. So it just it always surprises me when people think that it's a good idea to keep me in the dark. All right. Tell us about the likelihood of because this is something else I hear the likelihood of the federal government or a federal agent or really any member of the federal law enforcement community manufacturing or planting evidence. What percentage of the time, if you had to guess, would you say that happens? Yeah, I, I haven't seen it in 15 years, thankfully. I haven't had to deal with something like that, nor have I had to deal with any type of Brady violation with, you know, with the prosecutor withholding evidence from me. Um, you know, you read about it in the paper, you might see the you know, article on Law 360, you might see something about a case being dismissed in the news because of some sort of prosecutorial misconduct. And of course, people think that that's just the norm. And, you know, it, it couldn't be further from the truth. It's an adversarial process. And I'm, I'm on the other, uh, other side of the aisle from, from a prosecutor, but rarely have I been across from one that I thought was truly untrustworthy and that I really thought was concealing evidence that I was entitled to. So, Thankfully, those are few and far between. I think people like to exaggerate how often they occur, uh, given what they read in, in the headlines, because any case that doesn't have that isn't going to generate the interest that a case that has to be dismissed because of that same misconduct. And to your point earlier, the federal government only brings charges after some sort of an exhaustive investigation. And, you know, the prosecutor will have examined the evidence 
six, seven, eight different ways to make sure that number one, the evidence is what the investigating party says it is, and two, that it's admissible. No prosecutor wants to try and get evidence in that is, you know, that is going to be thrown out later because of some sort of intentional misconduct. So it's just, you know, I hear, I, I regularly hear stories from friends and family members who have, who have people that they know who have been accused of crimes and they're like, oh, this was manufactured. And, and you know, that never happens. It just doesn't, like, you know, there's like two people in the country that manufacture evidence and they're all busy. You know, <laughs> it's, they, they, that's just not the way this works. All right, Sammy. So I want you to, um, I want you to share with us your, um, your philosophy, uh, the, the guiding philosophy for business development that you have, because you have a very, um, specific focused way that you choose to develop business. And I want you to do that in just one minute. I need to remind the folks who are with us today that we are brought to you by Sandrowski Corporate Advisors. For over 35 years, the folks at Sandrowski have been providing expert client service in the areas of dispute advisory, business valuation, litigation support, forensic accounting, family office advisory, consulting, tax planning. I mean, these folks do some of the most sophisticated accounting you will ever need. In fact, they've written the book on cyber issues and specifically family office and uh, private equity valuations. So if you own a business now and you have a, an issue related to your family office or an issue related to private equity, let's say you're selling your company to a private equity fund, the thing you need to do before you disclose your financial information to that hedge fund you call Sandrowski, have them go through your books with a fine tooth comb, have them fix anything that needs to be fixed. I'm not saying there may be something in there that is improperly accounted for, but make the books as clean as possible so that when the fund that's buying your business reviews the books, they look as good as possible. In addition, you want to make sure you've done everything you can from a business formation standpoint to make the sale easy. So Sandrowski will do everything from reviewing the formation, the entity you've chosen for your business, all the way through to looking at your books, to making sure your business documents are ready to be reviewed by somebody who's going to scrutinize them and really scrutinize them hard because they're going to be paying good money for your business. In addition to that, Sandrowski can help you with a valuation for your business. Is the fund that's going to buy your business offering you a fair price? Sandrowski can do an analysis. They can look at the market. They can look at your financials and they can let you know if they think the price is fair. They do this not only with private private businesses that are being sold to hedge funds. They do this with businesses merging, businesses being sold. If you have any type of business transition, you need to call Sandrowski Corporate Advisors today and get their counsel on whether or not you're getting the price you deserve, whether or not you're paying the price you deserve, and just to make sure that everything is as clean as possible to make the transaction smooth. You can reach out to Sandrowski at 866-717-1607, 866-717-1607. Sandrowski Corporate Advisors, they're a CPA firm with a different perspective. We're also brought to you by my revenue a new roadmap guide. So you're an attorney, you want to develop your book of business and you want to develop your book of business because you want control of your future. You need to put together some sort of business development plan. How do you do it? Well, I'm going to give you a template. Go to revenueroadmapguide.com, revenueroadmapguide.com, enter your contact info. You'll be able to download for free my business development template, and then you can customize it for you and your practice. This is the same template I use with my clients. The minute they call me, I say, great, thanks for hiring me. Here's your template. We need to work on this together. That revenue roadmap guide I'm giving to you as a gift because I appreciate and Sammy appreciates you listening, watching this show. Revenueroadmapguide.com, enter your contact info there. Download it for free today. All right, Sammy, so you have a, uh, a really cool approach to business development, an approach that I respect a great deal. Talk about how you get most of your clients. Yeah, so I mean, a, a lot of my clients come to me from referrals from other attorneys and other business professionals. So, um, you know, I, I spend a great deal of time networking, building relationships with other people, particularly attorneys. And there's always opportunities, whether it's a conflict case or a case that comes from a large firm that might be too small for them 
or a case that comes from a firm, let's say in Los Angeles that doesn't want to go to New York. Um, you know, there's always opportunities for me to get work that way. Um, and then other ways, it's just kind of honing my craft, continuing to write, get published, uh, let people know what I'm doing, let people know that I'm, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the experts in the field. Okay. And talk about how you've, uh, how you've developed these relationships over the years and how you've main, maintained them, how you've managed to stay in touch, because, you know, you can connect with, uh, you know, with a criminal defense attorney or with a, with a, you know, an investigator or somebody who does, uh, forensics in California tomorrow, and they're not going to have a case tomorrow. They may have a case a year from now for you in Chicago. So how do you, how do you stay in touch with them over, over the years? Yeah, it's just a matter of, of staying top of mind, but doing it in a way that's not obnoxious. So, you know, uh, for me personally, I, I receive newsletters quite a bit. And some people like to send their newsletters once a week, some are once a month. Um, it, I, I like to be a little bit more subtle than that. You know, for me, it's using LinkedIn as a way of staying connected with people, being able to post about something that I've done, whether it's a publication, whether it's a trial victory, letting people know that I'm still top of my field. Um, and just maybe emailing people one to one and just saying, Hey, you know, I'd love to kind of reconnect with you, see how you're doing. I'd uh, love to hear what you've been up to and, and, you know, expressing an interest in learning about what they're doing as opposed to just telling them what you're doing. That tends to resonate with people a little bit more. So it's all about the subtle art of staying in touch and staying top of mind. Well, oh, that's terrific. Now, talk a little bit about you and I met through an organization named Provisors and you have a, a strategy that you're employing in Provisors and it's no secret because people see you all over the place. So talk about how you've leveraged, you've done probably one of the best jobs of the people that I met in the four months so far that I've been involved of, you know, really leveraging the opportunities that Provisors gives to people. So Talk about how you've leveraged this organization to increase awareness for you, for your practice, and for what you do. Yeah, so I mean, uh, Provisors has regions all over the country, and I'm based in the Chicago region. And throughout the pandemic, when everything was shut down and there wasn't really a whole lot going on, you know, I just guessed it across the country, and I repeatedly guessed so people would constantly see me, constantly remember me, and wouldn't forget who I am. And so I just took the opportunity to say, you know, things are on Zoom now, and I'm never going to be able to connect with these people in Orange County or in San Francisco or in Boston as easily as I as I can right now. So I took advantage of the opportunity, and I made relationships all over the country. And it's, it's worked out so perfectly that it's to the point now, if I was traveling to any city where there's a provisor's hub, I could just send a message, and I could, you know, set up a, a luncheon or a dinner with a slew of people and just get to meet them in person. All right. Now, you're, uh, you know, you, you mentioned that you guessed a lot, but here's, so here's what goes into that, right? Each provisor's meeting is two hours long. And then you do, uh, you, you have a get together with two other people after the provisor's meeting. The provisor's has labeled those Troika, which given the recent unpleasantness with Russia and Ukraine, maybe a, an inartful name to say the least. But anyway, provisor's has labeled them Troikas, but each of those tends to be an hour long too. So you, Sammy, will go sometimes to a morning meeting, right? So that's 7 a.m. in Chicago. And then sometimes you'll do a 7 a.m. meeting on the West Coast, too. That's virtual. So that's 10 a.m. So maybe between that hour, you grab like a bagel, a cup of coffee, and you read the paper to see if there's anybody you know whose name's mentioned in the paper. And then you go to the, the California meeting. And that in and of itself is a time commitment. But then you have these, these troikas where... I think the real, I mean, the, the meetings are great, but I think the troikas are where there's real value afterwards. But for me, I tried doing three meetings a week, which is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, right? Just the morning meetings, the troikas are what kills me. It's the, it's the additional time commitment, and that tends to be the best part of the meeting. How do you manage that? How do you juggle that with your schedule? Because if you're doing six meetings a week, then there's an, so that's six times two is 12 hours just for the meetings. Then there's an additional hour per meeting. So basically you've got another, what, you've got another six hours of troikas that will come like a week later. I mean, you're talking about like 18 hours. So, you know, almost if you work a 60 hour week, it's a third of your week. If you work a, you know, 40 hour week, it's half of your week. 
that is a huge time commitment. How do you manage all that? Yeah. So, I mean, thankfully, because courts are on Zoom or telephonic, it saved me a lot of drive time, a lot of flight time. So I've taken advantage of that extra time that I've had thanks to the pandemic. Um, but also, I mean, you know, if I start a Boston meeting, that's 6 a.m. Central. So from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m., when I normally wouldn't be doing a whole lot um, if I wasn't Fair doing enough. Zoom, um, you know, I can do an entire meeting without you know, affecting my workday. You know, then there's the California meetings, nine to 11. Those are kind of right in the middle of the workday where I try to squeeze in a quick Zoom court appearance before I do that. Um, you know, but then, you know, with, with the Troikas, I mean, I can set those up if I'm troiking with someone from California, 3 p.m. Pacific, 5 is 5 p.m. Central. So that's kind of after the workday, could even be later than that. Um, and then there's times I could set during the lunch hour. So I can't remember the last time I just left the office and took a lunch hour. Um, so it's a time commitment for sure. It's becoming more and more difficult to keep up with that type of a schedule now that things are opening up more. People are coming back into the office a little bit more. But uh, I wanted to take advantage of the opportunity before ProVisors reverted a little bit to more in-person meetings and took that opportunity away from me. The thing I'm pointing out to people is that Everybody complains they don't have a lot of time, but this guy's got a brand new baby, right? How old is your baby now? <laughs> He's eight months old. Your baby's eight months old, all right? So for the last eight months, this guy's getting no sleep and still he's <laughs> finding a way to do his business development work. He's spending probably between 12 and 18 hours a week doing business development work. So everybody out there who's listening to this, you are no longer allowed to tell me that you don't have time for business development when Sammy Azari with a brand new baby at home is spending 18 hours a week doing business development work. All right, now Sammy, talk to me about um, the, the importance of you connecting with other criminal defense attorneys. You touched on it, but connecting with other criminal defense attorneys in other jurisdictions. And the reason I want you to do this is because it has implications. It ha it's, it's a lesson for people in other industries where they shouldn't be treating these folks, the, the folks in other industries as competitors. They should treat them as colleagues. Talk about how important criminal defense attorneys in other cities are to you and your practice. Yeah, they're extremely important. I mean, I could tell you that my biggest case of 2021 came from a criminal defense attorney in Los Angeles. And it was a matter in upstate New York that I'm currently handling. And that was the, the best and the biggest referral that I received last year. Um, so I've, I, I love meeting people in other jurisdictions. I've met them in Arizona and Oklahoma and New York and everywhere in between. And there's always opportunities for, for synergy. So whether it's a matter that they're conflicted out of. It could be a matter where there's multiple defendants and you want to be top of mind to work with them. Maybe you do a joint defense agreement. Could be a matter where they're not willing to travel to another city. And they, the first thing they do is think of you. So a lot of people might think, okay, well, this is a competitor. I'm not really going to collaborate with them. And I found that it's just the opposite, that they're my biggest supporters and my, my biggest referrers are people that some of might consider a competitor. You know, the other thing that strikes me that makes you so successful at this strategy is you're, uh, you're very easy to get along with. And I, you know, everybody that I run into, and this is, this is not an exaggeration. I don't have to say this. I, I could have moved on to another question, but everybody that I run into and I tell them, Hey, I'm in, I'm in provisors. And they ask me what group. And I say Chicago four. And they're like, Chicago four. I'm like, yeah, Sammy Azari's group. Oh, Sammy Azari. Great guy. It's almost like you're like Azari is your middle name and great guy is your last name. You have done an outstanding job. And maybe it was your parents who did an outstanding job of raising you, of getting a reputation as a nice guy. Talk about how people want to, they always want to hire the pit bull litigator, but that reputation is not the reputation that gets you the clients. It's a reputation like you have that gets you the clients. Explain to people why it's better especially if you're a litigator, to be known as a guy who gets along with people, as a guy who, you know, who's professional, but is a nice guy. Explain how you've been able to use that to your advantage. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, thank you for the compliment. I really appreciate that. It's nice to know that there's, you know, some people out there that, that consider me a nice guy. I appreciate that very much. Um, but as far as, yeah, that the whole pit bull mentality, it's never been my thing. Um, it's one thing to aggressively cross-examine someone, and it's one thing to just be somebody that is overly aggressive and unnecessarily harsh. 
I mean, you know, clients don't want to hire someone that they're borderline afraid of. You know, they don't want to hire someone that they think is going to ruffle feathers. You know, they want someone that's able to, you know, get along with the other side because in, in a lot of cases, we have to kind of collaboratively, collaboratively work with the government. And they don't want someone that, that is going to just adversely affect any type of synergy that can occur between the defense, uh, defense and the government. And I think more of that's television. I think a lot of people see that on TV. You know, it's attractive, it sells, but I've seen that in real life, which is <laughs> so different from television law, um, is that the, the nicer attorneys that have good relationships with prosecutors and other defense attorneys that achieve the best outcomes for their clients. Now, Sammy, there's there's a question that, um, you know, maybe, maybe I should have asked at the beginning, but I, I've saved it for toward the end of the interview. Because I hate, I hate asking this question to criminal defense lawyers because, and you know, I, I've said this to you before, I know the reason why, but for the person who's out there that has listened to you and that has said, man, this guy's a really nice guy. He probably could have done anything he wanted. Why is he working with, with criminals, right? Answer the question for people about why, why criminal defense and the importance of having really good lawyers defend people who are accused of crimes. Why is that so important? Why is that essential to our justice system? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's all about the Constitution, right? And, you know, people want to defend the Constitution. They believe in the Constitution. But when it comes to things that they believe are, are morally reprehensible, they want to throw their Constitution out the window. And that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So you, you can't just view the Constitution in a vacuum. It applies everywhere and to everyone, irrespective of whether or not that, whether or not somebody feels that way. And what I also don't understand about when I get that question, which is quite a bit, is that, you know, they, they think that every crime is, is the most heinous thing in the world. And even if it's not a, a violent crime, even if you take a, a crime like the varsity blues college admission scandal, you know, these wealthy people that were trying to, you know, get even more of an advantage than they already had. A lot of people are focusing more on, you know, how their, their hatred of people that are maybe wealthier or in a better position, as opposed to the actual crime that was committed, which was, you know, pr pretty, certainly terrible and certainly bad parenting, putting it mildly. Um, but the crime really wasn't all that reprehensible compared to other things that we see. It's, you know, they just had this visceral reaction because of the fact that it was a wealthy defendant. So, you know, in that sense, I'm representing people that have made a mistake, that acknowledge they made a mistake, and I'm trying to basically stop the bleeding and make sure that the government doesn't trample on my client's rights, which I think everyone would agree is a good thing. All right. Now, along those lines, actually, that, that raises, a, that raises an, an, another question about uh, in, in this area. And that, that question is how much of the, you know, how much of the sentencing for when it, so you're, you know, after the case is done, you know, let's say, unfortunately, it doesn't go your way. You had a tough case. You did everything you could. doesn't go your way. How much flexibility does, does the judge have in sentencing in some of these cases, some of them, some of the cases have, have mandatory minimums, but how much flexibility does a judge have in other, uh, in other cases and how does contrition, how does, um, you know, the, the ability of your client to, uh, you know, either make restitution or, uh, own up to some of the, some of the facts of the case, how much does that impact it absent, potential appeals and, you know, civil cases and that sort of thing in a straight, straight criminal matter? Yeah. So, I mean, that's an excellent question. So the judge has tremendous power in fashioning a sentence that, you know, typically it's within the guideline range or it could be below or a little bit above, depending on the facts of the case. Um, but there's a lot of factors that the, the judge has to take into account. Number one is the sentencing memorandums filed by the parties. Uh, any mitigation material that was attached on behalf of the defendant. It could be um, letters by family and friends that the judge read. It could be in cases involving sex, a psychosexual evaluation, a mental health evaluation. It could be any psychological progress that the defendants made along the way. Um, it could be the allocution statement that the defendant gives the judge expressing his remorse, his regret, the shame he's brought his, himself and his family, you know, his admission to the offense. All those things play a huge role in helping the judge fashion a sentence. Um, you know, I've had cases where clients were 
contrite and it was very clear and they were upfront with their uh, about their conduct and they received sentences below the guideline range and I've seen the opposite happen where they received the sentence that they didn't have to get and they have nobody to blame but themselves because of the way they conducted themselves at the sentencing hearing. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's 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 an interesting it's an interesting concept. How hard is it after, you know, after the case is over, how difficult is it for you to convince a um, you know, a client that listen, you know, here's this is what we're looking at and this is if you, you know, if you do this, you got a good shot at getting a better sentence. If you don't, the, the likelihood is is it's going to be it's going to be pretty bad. How difficult is it usually to convince folks that they need to own up to it? Yeah, it's usually not hard. I mean, I, I've had cl- a few and far between that I've seen a client um, reject that advice and just continue to want to deny you know their conduct, and it didn't work out very well for them. But the clients that really want to see the lightest sentence possible will owen up to the conduct. They will have friends and family there to support them that have written letters. They will get any type of, you know, evaluation that's necessary to show that they're moving past uh, the crime that they committed. So the ones that are serious about getting the lightest sentence will absolutely heed my advice. And thankfully, I haven't had too many people stray from that. All right, Sammy, um, before we go to the uh, to the end part where I ask you for three things, I need to ask you the the one really tough question. How hard is it when you know your client is really not guilty? Is it is it more stressful to defend a client who you're sure is not guilty than a client who maybe is guilty, they still deserve a good defense, or you're not sure. Is it really like a, like a true, somebody who you know didn't do this? Is that, is that what keeps you up at night? Is that the most difficult client? Yeah, that's the added pressure right there is when you, you think you've done all the homework on the case, you're very familiar with it, you know the prosecution's made a mistake, and you just can't seem to convince them of that, and there's always an opportunity for your client to get found guilty. Those are the scariest ones because you absolutely believe your client. You absolutely believe that this result should be different than uh, what could potentially happen at trial, which could be a guilty verdict. Um, And the fact that you you just can't convince somebody else of that is is mind boggling. Now, you you face a lot. I would imagine and maybe I'm wrong. You can correct me, but you face the same prosecutors from time to time. Right. So they you know, over the years, they're going to get to know you. They're going to get to know your demeanor. I mean, it's like playing poker with the same people. Only it's not that frequent. Right. But you do face some of the same people over and over again. They know your reputation. They see you at bar events. They see you at charitable events and stuff like that. Can't they get a sense like you, I mean, of course, you're never going to tip your hand when somebody really is guilty and, and say it, but can't they get a sense for just the urgency that, the, with which you're, I mean, they shouldn't be able to, but it's human nature. Don't, isn't there a vibe that they can feel like, I think Sammy's got something here that's unusual. Like, don't you think that they can feel that? Absolutely. I mean, I, I like to think that if I'm approaching them and asking them for something that is beyond the norm for how that case would normally get resolved, that they know that I believe I have something legitimate. And that's not something I'm going to do on every case. You know, I'm going to do it for clients that truly deserve it, whose innocence I truly believe in. Now, with that being said, if, if I think a client's guilty, I'm still going to advocate for the, the best sentence possible. But to really go above and beyond and just approach a prosecutor and say, look, this case really needs to get dismissed. And here's why. Um, I really, really need to be convinced. And if I'm doing that, a prosecutor knows that I legitimately believe it. And I'm not just trying to do that on every case that I'm going to have with them. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, it's, it's a really interesting concept and it's, it's the kind of thing that takes, uh, it takes nerves of steel. So I commend you for doing it and I'm glad you're doing it because that's what, that's what makes the system work. All right, Sammy. So I'm going to ask you now, take a minute and think about three things that we want folks to come away from our time together today. Uh, with three things that people should remember from our time together. We covered a lot of ground, covered a lot of different things. So think about the three things that you want people to come away with. I'll give you a minute because I'm going to remind people that we're brought to you by Sandrowski Corporate Advisors. They're the CPA firm with a different perspective. This means 
that they can help you with a number of things that most CPA firms won't. Now, I mentioned before about business valuations. Let's talk a little bit about litigation support. So you, you're, you and your partner decide you're gonna split up and your partner was the one who was doing the books. Now you have to decide what your portion of your business is really worth. Your partner says it's worth X, but you think it's worth X plus 100. How do you settle that dispute? Well, you may have to go to litigation, but before you do that, you could suggest to your partner that you have Sandrowski come in and do a valuation on the business. And if Sandrowski values the business closer to what you want, then you got something to work with. If they value it closer to what your partner wants, then you know that's a true valuation and there's really no other deal to be made. Now, in the event this does get contentious and it goes to full-blown litigation, and they didn't want to bring Sandrowski in mutually, you can hire Sandrowski. Your lawyer actually should be the one to hire Sandrowski because then confidentiality is attached. And Sandrowski will, under subpoena, get all the records. They'll look at everything. And then you know whether you got a good litigation case or not. And the folks at Sandrowski, they've testified a number of times in court. And they're very, very good at taking complex financial issues and breaking them down so simple that, and I'm gonna whisper this because I don't want Sammy to get in trouble, even a judge can understand it. So if you need help with anything related to litigation support or any type of financial work related to a trial or some sort of a litigation matter, you gotta give Sandrowski a call. You can reach them at 866-717-1607. That's 866-717-1607. Sandrowski Corporate Advisors is a CPA firm with a different perspective. I also want to remind you, if you haven't done it already, you need to do it right now. Go to revenueguide.com. That's your free revenue roadmap. That's your step-by-step -step guide to business development. Revenueroadmapguide.com. Enter your contact info there. Get your business development plan. Get the plan that you can use to grow your book of business today. All right, Sammy, the three things that we should take away from our time together are... Yeah, so I, I had a minute to think about this. So I'd say number one, build relationships. Relationships are the lifeblood of any business, and I don't care what you do. Uh, number two, always hone your craft. Uh, whatever your business is, just always make sure you're at the top of your game. You know, continue to research, write, you know, whatever it takes to, to be better. And then lastly, do right by the client. Make sure they're happy and feel valued because they, you know, they might come back, they might recommend their friends to come to you. Um, so I just always do those three things and that's been very success. That's helped my business be successful over the last you know, 15 years. All right. Three really good gems there from Sammy Azari. If you like what you heard today, give us a hey now down in the comments. Sammy Azari, thank you so much for joining us today. It was an absolute pleasure having you. Yeah, it was great to be here. Thanks for having me on. All righty, folks, that'll do it for this episode of The Inside BS Show. We'll be back here again tomorrow with another great interview. Until then, I'm Dave Lorenzo. Here's hoping you make a great living and live a great life.